firefly. The firefly was always in the in the in the in the forest, flying and shining away and, and, and shining and showing light, giving light into the darkness. But once upon a time there was also a serpent. The serpent hated the firefly. So the serpent always trying to set a trap to ambush the firefly. Everywhere he went, so the, the serpent was around trying to ambush the firefly. But every time the firefly was very smart, always managed to escape and fly away. Until one day the firefly was so tired. Always this persecution. Why? Do, so the firefly mustered all the courage and was fly near the serpent and ask, Mrs. Serpent, why do you persecute me? Why do you do this? No, I provide light into the darkness. I help other animals. But why do you do that to me? I know the serpents don't eat fireflies, so why do you want to eat me? So the serpent stopped, looked back and hissed and answered, Mr. Firefly, I don't know why I hate you. What I do know is this. Your light bothers me. Now, stop right there, friends. If you, we are meant to shine and fly like the fireflies are. We're not meant to crawl on the dust as the serpent is. So every time you let your light shine bright, you will either bless some, but I can guarantee you others will be bothered by your light. So we have to let our light shine as bright as possible and not bother about the serpent around us because the serpent will always will be there. As Bartholomew Whitemore Seventh-day Adventist Church, today it is an important day because today we are deciding that we're going to let our light shine no matter how much persecution we get from the serpent, from the devil. So here today is a moment. That we will let our lights shine like we sang here. Shine, Jesus shine. Today we embark into a new moment, a historical moment at the Bowden White Marsh Church. As we move along with our mission and vision statements. Everything that we're doing from now on, we as church, as pastor, as board, as leaders, we have to look back to our mission, into our vision and say, this that we are doing right now, how will this help us? to fulfill our mission and arrive at our vision. And I thought no better way to talk about our mission and vision statements as we go along with this than to preach a series on the three angels' messages. Now, this is a powerful message in the Bible and sometimes we kind of shy away from this. But let me tell you this. The three angels' messages, I'm sure you have, if you have already attended a Seventh-day Adventist church, at least for a little bit, for a little while, you will know that you have heard about them. But some people may not have idea what, what do they really mean, what are these three angels all about. So here today we will learn about what do they actually mean and how important, I mean, what relevance they actually have for our lives. Okay? So... If you have heard of them, my goal through this three-part series is to teach you and explain to you what do they mean and the relevance they have for you in your lives. The three angels' messages are found in the book of Revelation. Now, you've got to get this. The book of Revelation is the last book in the Bible. And it's three angels, Celeste, are probably the last three angels giving a warning unto the world. So you have to know that something is about to happen. This is not just a mere coincidence. These are the most likely the three last warnings this world is about to receive. It's a world that is a, at the brink of total despair, is a brink of total hopelessness, and the three angels' messages, in the core of them, they speak about hope. Amen? Are you guys there? Amen. There you are there. Now let me tell you this here. Some people say, I don't like the three news messages because they talk about the beast. They are about the beast. Let me tell you this. Yes, we will talk about the beast in the next two sermons. We will identify the beast and the mark of the beast. But let me tell you what the three angels' messages are. They are not about the beast. They are about the best. Because the best always comes before the beast. So we will see Jesus being uplifted through the three angels' messages. Amen? 
So today, as our first message, I need to establish at least a little bit of a foundation here as we go here with this. So there are two things that I want to make sure that we know so we will be able to understand the following messages. The first question that we will have to address is, who are the three angels? I mean, who are they and who is this message to? Alright, so again, who are the angels? Well, I think we have to take a quick reading on the three angels' messages as a whole. I don't know if you can read, probably you can read from the screen, but if you don't, if you cannot read, go to your Bibles, Revelation chapter 14, it will be reading verses 6 through verse 12. It's a little bit of a reading, but we need to read the whole message to begin grasping this idea, okay? So Revelation 14, on the screen you can follow with me, Revelation 14, verse 6. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to, <coughs> to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, this is the angel, okay? Fear God and do what? Give him glory because of the hour of his judgment has come. And do what? Worship him who made heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water. This is the first what? First angel. Then the second angel says, another angel second followed saying, what does the angel say? Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. That is the second angel. Now watch what the third angel says. It says, and another angel, third, follow them saying with a loud voice. What does he say? If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be what? Tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Wow! That's a tough text to read, right? It doesn't really, doesn't go well with our so media today. That everything must be fine and dandy and peachy and creams. But the, the Bible also has some hardcore messages. Now, look what he says, verse 11. And, and the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, they, these worshippers of the beast and its image. And whoever receives the mark of its name, and by the way, you don't have the time to address all of this here today, but I can guarantee we'll talk about this idea of eternal torment, which is not a biblical truth. But here's something that you need to get. Verse 12 now. Can we read this together? It says, that, Here is a call for what? Endures of whom? Of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus Christ. So we read it through in those messages. Now we need to start unpacking a little bit what do they mean. So again, so who are the three angels? Are these three angels literal angels? Are they like real angels flying in the skies? Well, the book of Revelation is full of symbolism. You have what? You have seven churches. You have seven seals, seven plagues, seven trumpets. You have John eating a book, literally eating a scroll, being what? In the mouth. Sweet in the mouth and what? Bitter in the in the stomach. Now, we, we, have so, we have four horsemen. We have so much stuff. So much symbolism. So, can we say that the three angels are literal? Which the three angels are not literal. As in an angel flying overhead in the skies. But the three angels, they mean something directly to us. The book of Revelation is full of symbolisms, but they mean something. Like a, a, a woman dressed in white in Revelation mean, represents a pure church. A woman seated on a beast dressed in scarlet represents a false church, a false teaching. And we will understand this in the next two sermons. So again, with so much symbolism, we cannot say that the three angels are literal. But we can say that they have a literal message. So, how do you know what, who they are? Well, the word angel in the Bible, in the Greek, is pretty much angelos, which means messenger, okay? So, it means messenger. So, the three angels are three messengers of God in the last days. How do we know who they are? Can we know who these messengers are just by reading the text? Yes. Revelation 14, 12, again, it tells us who they are. Can you read this together? It said, here is a call for what? For endurance. Of whom? Of whom? Of the saints. What do they do? Who are they? Those who what? Keep the commandments of God and have their faith in Jesus Christ. So, there it is. 
So the three angels of God, the three angels' messages, the three angels, they are God's people, God's faithful people in the last days. That's who they are. And because, precisely because they are sharing these three messages, they suffer persecution. Therefore, they must endure. Are you guys following me? Are you guys there with me? Yes. Right, okay, good. So again, who should this message be going to? Who should be getting this message? Is it for a select group of people? Is it only for Baltimore White Marsh area? Is it, what is it? Well, again, the text says very clearly, then I saw what? Another angel flying directly overhead with a, a what? Eternal gospel to proclaim to those who were. Dwell on earth to every nation and tribe and language and people. So the last three messages into this world is an inclusive message. Amen? God is not making partiality here. Some people know. These are some people. This message is to the whole world. It's a global message. So the message goes again to the whole what? The whole world. So well, now we got this. We know that the three angels are a representation of God's people in the last days. And now we know the message goes to the whole world. We are ready now to get into a little more detail then. What is the content then of this message? What this message teaches about? What is this message all about? So, four points. Are you guys there with me? Four points. You have in a study guys though, so you can write them down. We're going to see now. The first angel message. We're looking to the first angel message. Angel's message, alright? The first point is this. That it reminds us to fear what? To fear whom? To fear God. The second point is that the first angel's message reminds us to do what? To worship the Creator. The third one is that remind us to do what? Re keep the Sabbath day holy. And the last one is that remind us about what? Of the of the judgment. Now you guys bear with me here because you're gonna some you're gonna learn a lot of stuff, new stuff today. There's some things I'm sure you have never heard before. So let's unpack this a little bit here. So it reminds us to fear God. How do we know this? Well, it says that very clearly, right? And he said with what? A loud what? Loud voice. Fear whom? God. And give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And do what? Worship him whom it happens and the sea and the springs of water. So there are many commands in here, fear, worship, glorify, but we have to ask, okay, fear God. Wait a minute, Pastor, wait a minute. Doesn't God say many times in the Bible, do not fear or do not be afraid? So how come then in the last book is God changing his mind? No, God is not changing his mind. Maybe you need to understand that, that to fear God in the Bible means something totally different. What does to fear God mean in the Bible? Well, the Bible answers very clearly. Look at this in the book of Ecclesiastes. Look what it says. It says what? And the end of the matter is what? All that has been heard. Fear God and do what? Keep His commandments. For this is what? The whole duty of every man. So friends, you've got to get this. Are you listening? Are you following me? I'm here. To fear God in the Bible is not to be afraid of Him. Oh my goodness, God is going to punish me. No, no. God is a loving God. To fear God in the Bible is to obey Him. And it's not by chance that Jesus says, If you love me, you do what? My, you know that. So if you, if you fear God, you love Him, He will do automatically keep His commandments. It's as simple as this. It's not complicated. Some people like to complicate, but it's as simple as it is. So again, basically, to fear God, it means to what? To obey Him. So now, it reminds us to do what? To worship the, the, the Creator. Now, watch this. Isn't that interesting that God told His prophet 2,000 years ago that in the last days, God's people will have to be talking about a Creator. Now, as a former atheist, as somebody who hated Christianity and studied philosophy and such, I can tell you with authority that a lot of young people there are losing their faith because they, they barely go through church throughout their, their early age. They enjoy their church. They don't like their church. Church is boring. Church is this. Whatever it is. So when they get to high school in public school or to an actual a college level, they take maybe biology 101 and philosophy 101, they barely know what philosophy is, and they think they are entitled to lose their faith. Yeah, I'm saying, I'm saying some truth here. So if you want to lose your faith, at least you're going to have to study. 
Don't go to a sorry school with a sorry teacher, like a philosophy one on one or biology one on one, and think you now you you have you you have lost all your faith because now we came from an evolution and we we don't have a creator. So you're gonna watch me here. I'm gonna say something like to you to understand. Basically, there are only two options. Are you following me? Are you guys listening to me? Young people, there are only two options. And if you study really hard, if you really, really go hard into this matter, you have only two options. We either came from a God who designed you and I and the universe in its order, or we came out of nothing. Did you hear that? We either came out of nothing by chance, or we came from the hands of a loving God. Ah, uh, come on, Diego, come on, man, we came out of nothing. Nobody says this. Be quiet. They do it. And I'm going to show you, I'm going to show you now some prominent names within science. Prominent scientists. And you will see their own claims, okay? So the first one is Bill Bryson. And, and to be truth here, he's actually saying kind of in a, in a way of being, trying to be kind and, and, and trying to be humorous in a way. But on his book, Short History of Nearly Everything, this is his, his, his comment. And so from nothing, our universe begins. Okay, Bill Bryson. Now there is more. Victor Stanger, on a more of a, of a serious note here, uh, God, the Phil Hypothesis, his book he published. Look what he said. I want you to pay attention on this. So where did the laws of nature, he's talking about entropy, gravity, and all the others, and the, the laws of thermodynamics, all of these laws, where do they come from? They came from where? From what? From nothing. No, no, no. It, it, it gets better here. Quentin Smith, on his book, he wrote, he co-authored this book with William Lane Craig, a Christian debater, and, and this book is a debate. If you get this book published in 1995, you actually read this book, it's a debate. Christian arguments and atheist arguments. Look at, look at the conclusion. I want you to get this point. The only what? The only what? Reasonable, reasonable belief is that we came from nothing, by nothing, and what? And for nothing. No, 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 no. Let, let, me, let me just stop here. Just once. So, so, so you, you, you get it. Am I the only one to notice that out of nothing, nothing comes? <laughs> out of nothing, nothing comes. Wake up. Out of no nothing is nothing. Absolutely nothing. So, you know what they're saying? Because if you want to become an atheist, like I was, you, you mean, if you really want to go deep into this atheism thing, and I don't know, I don't think we have a God out there, somehow I think we all evolved from monkeys or, or amoebas, I don't know, if you're not getting into this thing, you need to understand this. Everything you hold dear to your heart, love, passion, charity, every, every value you have, helping the poor, helping the orphan, all of this is total meaningless. In a void of oblivion, love, care, passion, humility, none of this makes any sense. You know why? Because they call this what? The survival of the what? Ah, uh, you know that, right? You heard that, survival of the fittest. So tell me this, what will make you, to, if you need to survive, why are you going to help somebody that is in need? They will slow you down. They will drag you down. Are you listening to your pastor? So there has got to be another moral sense there. But no, it, it, it gets worse, okay? On, on, on this book, Lawrence Krauss wrote this book, A Universe from Nothing, okay? And, 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 and look, look, look what happens here. Uh, how many of you guys know Neil deGrasse Tyson? I'm sure he's very famous, you know, he's all over the TV and talks about this, very atheist, and, and commenting on his book, A Universe from Nothing. This is what he says. Can you read this? What? Nothing is what? No, nothing is not nothing. Nothing is what? Do you see this is an absurd? Wake up! This is ridiculous. This is just as well. You might just want to say, this is not a bottle, this is a chicken. I mean, if I say this, you better just call the doctors here, you know, Natalie's psychiatrist, and just come, come into the hospital. No matter what I say, this is not a chicken. Nothing is nothing. And you watch this stuff, and you go and believe this stuff. You have barely taken philosophy one on, biology one on, and you think you've lost all your faith. Where do you stand, for God's sake? This is serious stuff. Go and study. 
find out for your own. And I'm telling you this with all my heart. I have scrutinized this faith. I have scrutinized the Christian faith and within the Adventism. And I can, the more you put it up to fire, the stronger it comes out. Don't be afraid of asking questions. Go and pers- ask your professors good questions. Where do you get that from? How can it come from nothing? Out of nothing, nothing comes. And they will not be able to answer that. Because out of nothing, nothing comes. Friend, bottom line is this. Everything you have ever done, everything you ever believed, if, if we didn't come from a creator, nothing makes any sense. Nothing. I get two options. We either came from our God who created us, or we came from nothing. Now, chances are, just mathematically, that out of nothing, nothing comes. Therefore, the only reasonable and logical explanation is that we came out of the hands of God. I'm not saying this is the only answer. I'm saying this is the best answer. With all humility, that's the best answer that we have. Until I don't find any other better answer, I'm going to stick with God. Because He has shown clearly revealed to myself that He is real. And, and, and just before we just conclude this part here, you know, uh, I just want to touch this base here, the theory of evolution. Oh, we evolved. You know, and there's so much garbage out there that you really have to study hard. You just go, but don't think you're the only one. They say, oh, all oh, the oldest scientists believe in evolution. That's garbage. They don't. Not all of them. And spe- speaking of which, Stephen Myers, a great geophysicist, famous all over the world, he's a Christian, and in his book, Darwin's Doubts, he unpacks and explains so many huge flaws, ridiculous flaws, on this, not only Darwinism, but new Darwinism, which, he came, which is more around today. All of this, but he's breaking them down. You pay 10 bucks in this little book, at least you're going to learn something more than you love from a professor in a sorry school with, with just trying to destroy your faith. Take this serious. Take this serious. If, if, God is, if God is real, if God exists, you better learn how to relate to Him. Now, if He doesn't exist, all of this is meaningless. Yes, you're right. All this church is meaningless. But if God is real, you got to get ready to meet your Maker. You better get ready to meet your maker. But he's not the only one. I just wanted to read this, uh, th- this professor, uh, uh, Colin Patterson. This was 1981. He was a senior principal on the scientific officer in the paleontology department in the British Museum. He came to America, to New York, and this is what he said in front of many people. This was not many publicized. A lot of people were ashamed about it, but this is what he says. The theory of what evolution makes predictions. We've tested it, and the predictions have been what? Falsified precisely. Evolution not only conveys what? No knowledge, but seems somehow to convey what? Anti-knowledge. So get your act together. Stop just watching one class and losing all your faith. Go and pursue it. You will see that we have a real God. This theory of evolution is pushed down our throats to government and all this bureaucracy that we have. It is just a propaganda agenda. They don't take... Bible out of schools, they don't take prayers out of school, but now they want to bring uh, Qurans into the schools, they want to bring like <coughs> Muslim prayers into the schools, but not Christian prayers. Excuse me? This is just an agenda to destroy our faith. Well, everything we stand for. Friends, we didn't come from monkeys. If you think you came from monkeys, good luck. I didn't. I know it came from the hands of a mighty God. I know I did by His grace. So again, the, the, the third thing, I think is an important thing, it reminds us of what? Of the Sabbath day. It, there is something very familiar about the first angel message in its language. And I want to show this to you, why it, it speaks about the Sabbath in the last days. Look what it says again, Revelation 14, 7. And read this with me. What? Fear God and give Him what? Glory. Well, it says right for His determined has come and worship Him who what? Made heaven, earth, and seas and what? And springs of water. Now, you, can you see that this is pointing back to a creator here? But look at the, the language. is the language of creation. Look what we have in Genesis at creation. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished. And all the hosts of them. And on what day? On the seventh day, God finished His work that He had done. And He did what? He did what? Rested on the seventh day from all His work that He had done. So God blessed the seventh day, and made it what? Holy, because God rested from all His work 
that he had done in creation. From the very first week of creation, God instituted the Sabbath as a memorial of creation. So as we are here on Sabbath day, we are reminded that we were what? Created by a God of love. We are not created to just to, to, to help Him because God has no needs. God created us out of love. God never needed us in the first place. So He brings us back to our Creator. Now, this thing about the Sabbath was so important, so crucial, Bridget, that God included that in the Ten Commandments. Look what He says. What? Remember the what? The Sabbath day to keep it what? Holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but on the seventh day is a Sabbath to home, to home, to the Lord, your God. On it you shall not what? Do any work. Why is this? Because for in six days, why do we have not to do any work? In six days God made what? Heaven and earth and sea and all that is in them and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Now, I want to show back the language. You've got to understand the Bible. They, didn't, they could not highlight. There's no underline. So they speak in language, in the way, in repetitions. Look at the language again. Revelation 14 says what? And worship Him who made what? Heaven, earth, and seas, and the springs of waters. And the fourth commandment says what? Lord, Lord made what? Heaven, and earth, and sea, and all that is where? In them, and rested on the seventh day. The languages are too strikingly similar for us to take it lightly. It's too much in there to take it lightly, friends. Right there, in the core of the three Indus messages, the very first message tells us we have a Creator. And by the way, He told us to rest on the Sabbath day. A day for us to rest. And how long has it been since you took a time to spend with your family? You work, you study all week long, you come to Sabbath, Saturday, you're still busy back and forth, running here and there. You have no time for your family, no time for yourself. You're not a machine. And God knew that from the beginning. And the last point here today is that the first angel mess, the angel's message reminds us of what? Of the, are you following me this? So, so far we have seen that the three angels' messages for the three angels are God's people in the last days. We see this message is delivered to the whole world. It reminds us that what? We have to fear God. We have to worship the what? The Creator. It reminds us of the what day? The Sabbath day. But also tells us about judgment. Now, the important thing here, I want you to notice this. Look what it says. I want you to read this with me again. All right, let's read it. So that, and, and, and he said, with what? Loud voice. Fear God and give Him glory because what? The hour of His judgment, what? Has come. Now stop right here. It says that the hour of His judgment has come. Meaning that judgment day is not coming in the future. Judgment is now. You and I are going through judgment. How do you know that, Pastor? Simply, when Jesus comes in the clouds of heaven, which is our blessed hope, there will be only two groups of people, the saved and the lost. So how can judgment take place? It has to be before. Judgment is here now, and there are billions of people, billions in this world that have no clue whatsoever that judgment is coming. Now, here, we usually think that judgment is a bad thing. You know, don't judge me. I don't judge you. Who am I to judge you? Don't we say that, right? So, we usually think that judgment is a bad thing. So, now let me tell you this. In the Bible, judgment is a great thing. You know why judgment is a great thing? Because it's God setting the record straight. So, all the rape, genocide, all those wealthy men being, making billions of dollars on our backs, one day, every unkind, every evil action will be accounted for. Every child that has been raped, every child that has been molested, every person that is starved to death because of greed, one day, those who caused that will be held accountable to God. So God is coming to bring justice, to set the record straight. So judgment in the Bible is not a thing for you to fear, to be afraid. You should be happy and proud of judgment because God is coming and He's going to set the record straight. God loves the orphans. God loves the widow. God loves you and I, but He's tired to see us suffering. Tired of seeing us in agony in this world. 
Yes, you may make money, you become a, a somebody with a lot of means, but then so what? You get a liver cancer and you go to, to your grave. What are you taking with you? Nothing. A world without God ends always in the grave. Ends in dust. Friends, I'm going to wrap up this now. Simple stuff. Simple. I'm going to make an appeal here again. Simple. We learn here today important things. Do you remember the story I told you at the beginning? The story about the firefly and the serpent, right? Firefly and serpent. You are meant to fly and let your light shine. If you don't do that, you may think that it will be safe to lurk and stay in the darkness. For you're not meant to do this. Baltimore White Marsh, Seventh-day Adventist Church, we are meant to shine and fly and soar with the living God. It is time for us not to bother about the serpent. It is time for us to actually enjoy that our light bothers the serpent and overshadows the serpent. It is time for us to let our light shine so brightly that we make the serpent blind. But we will not stop sharing and, and, sh and, and shining unto the world. So the appeal that I have today is very, very simple. It's not complicated. The first appeal that I have, maybe you have not feared God recently. Maybe you're breaking God's commandments and you know it. And you, you, you're concerned because you're coming to a point you just don't care anymore. The Spirit of living God is talking to you today. Invite a praise team to come to the front. We're going to sing the theme song for the series, We Have This Hope. And as we are singing this song, if you want to recommit your life to God and obey God, you break one up, come to the front to have a special prayer for you. But I also have an appeal for those who, who maybe were losing their faith they be wondering, do, do I really come from a God? Are you really there, of God? Do you really exist? Do you care about me? If maybe you're wondering if God is your creator really, and if He loves you, you're struggling with your faith. As we sing, we have this hope. Come also to the front. I want to pray very specially for you, because I know what it's like to lose my faith. I know what it's like not to believe in God and to doubt. And I know God can be real to you. My third appeal is maybe for you that have not kept the Sabbath day holy. Friend, you're not a machine. You deserve a break. When was the last time you spent quality time with your wife? You just stop and look at her smile and just enjoy her smiling. When was the last time you actually spent quality time with your kids without a TV or cell phone in front of your face? The Sabbath is for that. Sabbath. Rest. You're tired. I know you are. Some of you come through the doors but with no smile sometimes, like you've been beat up all week. You need a break. You need Jesus. You need the Sabbath. So I want to invite you, if you need a break, you need to rest, and you want to, you want to follow God on His fourth commandment, and you're struggling with your job, come to the front at the prayer and the song and surrender there to God. And my last appeal that I have here today. Are you afraid of the judgment? If Jesus were to come today, Kayla, would you be ready when He comes? Marcus, if Jesus was here today, would you, Natalie, Olive, and Penelope be ready? Nicole, Larissa, would you be ready if Jesus was here? Chloe, friends, this is a very specific appeal I have for you today. If you want to be ready when Jesus comes, you don't want to be afraid of judgment. You want to look forward to judgment. Wherever you are, as we sing, we have this hope. Come to the front. Come here as we will pray. And if God impresses your heart for baptism or rebaptism, I'll be at the door right there. Come and speak to me. We'll make sure we can work that out. We have baptisms two weeks from now. We have baptisms in July and August coming up. All you got to say, Pastor, I, I, I want to know more about this.